Welcome back everyone. Uh, in this lecture, uh, we will continue with the isomorphism theorems. So, now we will see actually the third isomorphism theorem. So, that is about uh, quotient of quotients. So, here is the fundamental question, okay. This quotient, the notion of quotient groups, okay. So, they are actually giving us uh, many, many interesting new families of groups, okay. But one can ask, okay, what is about if you start with the quotient group and then take, okay, some normal subgroup of that which will look like another quotient, okay, then what will happen to like quotient of quotients? So, whether you get anything new from this uh, procedure, like whether you get some new groups, okay, or the new constructions, let us put it that way, new groups in the sense. Uh, is it a new construction, but indeed it is not actually a new construction, it will be again some other quotient group, actually the second iterative will not give anything new, okay. So, let me just first formulate then it will be clear what I was actually talking about. So, here, uh, so let us recall, okay, again we denote uh, G be a group, okay. Now, let us say G has uh, actually two subgroups both are let us say normal and one subgroup is contained in another subgroup, okay. So, let us take some situation like this. So, let me draw it using the diagram again. So, you have G and then let us say you have H and then you have N. So, N is subgroup of H and H is subgroup of G. Assume both N and H they are normal in G. So, this is the assumption. So, this is the assumption, okay. So, now we can actually consider various possible quotients, okay. So, what one can do, for example, like one can take this uh, G modulo H, G modulo N and one can actually verify that N also will be normal in H. So, one can take H modulo N and we want to actually see whether one can compare these quotients or not, okay. So, that is the, that is the thing. So, indeed what we are going to prove, okay, with this hypothesis, okay, let me state the theorem. So, this is the third isomorphism theorem. So, as before let G be a group okay, and N subset of H subset of G or the normal subgroups. of G, okay. So, then what we have? We have an isomorphism. of the following groups. What it is? So, first what you do? You take G modulo H which makes sense. So, then that is isomorphic to G modulo N modulo H modulo N. So, this you can remember it as like cancelling N basically, okay. So, so when you take this uh, group, okay, G modulo N, so there are so many things are hidden in this uh, statement, okay. So, for example, first of all H modulo N makes sense. So, what is the meaning of that? So, that means N is normal in H. So, that is the first observation. The second observation, so in particularly H modulo N can be treated as a subgroup of G modulo N and this is again normal in G modulo N. So, then only we can actually make this quotient, okay and H is already given to be normal in G. So, then once we have these two observation, then we can make this G modulo N modulo H modulo N. We are saying that 
this quotient of quotient is again a quotient. Okay. So, when you go to the second iterative that is when you consider this quotient of quotient you are not getting anything new you are getting only the quotient. Okay. So, it is very very powerful result. So, let us let us verify uh, the hidden statements first okay, these statements and then later I will actually prove that this size. Again this isomorphism also will come from the first isomorphism theorem. So, first isomorphism theorem in a way it is the mother theorem for all isomorphism theorems. So, all other isomorphisms can be only proved using first isomorphism theorem. Okay. So, let us see the proof. So, what is given let us recall n h they are normal in G and n is subgroup of h that is all given. So, this is given. So, now what we want to verify let us verify that n is normal in h. Okay. So, how do we verify let us take some x in h and look at x n x inverse but n is normal in g. So, x n x inverse will be n okay, as x is in g and n is normal in g. So, that proves that n must be normal in h. So, this is verified. So, this is in some, some sense obvious because n is normal in G. So, normalizer of n in G will be G and H is just a subgroup of actually this normalizer. So, if you go back to that B being normal in A B that I proved in the last class, you can see that this n H is exactly H. So, n is normal in H. Okay. So, this is something we already verified. So, what is about the second statement? So, now it, now it makes sense H modulo n is normal in G modulo n sorry uh, H modulo n is a group that makes sense. Okay. So, now if you think about it what is G modulo n? G modulo n is nothing but all left co sets of uh, n in G. Okay. So, in particularly we can think of H modulo n as a subset of G modulo n no issue. Okay. But this is something we already verified. If you have a group homomorphism from G to G dash, if you take H to be a subgroup of G, then if you look at the image phi of H inside G dash, so this is also your subgroup. If you start with the subgroup and if you take, an, take image of a subgroup that must be subgroup. In particularly, you have this quotient map pi from G to G modulo n. Okay. Then it is not hard to see okay, this is mapping x to x n. So, then pi of capital H will be just H modulo n. Okay. This will be all those x n where x is coming from capital H. So, using this result which we proved already, okay, this is something we proved already. So, using this we can see that pi of h which is h modulo n is a subgroup of g modulo n. Okay. So, h is being subgroup of g modulo n is obvious. Okay. So, this is fine. We want to verify h modulo n is indeed normal in g modulo n. So, this is also something I gave it as exercise. But let us verify it here. Okay. We want to verify H modulo n is normal in G modulo n. So, how do we verify? Start with some element, let us call it G n inside G modulo n. So, let this now consider. Okay. So, what we need to verify? G n H modulo n and then G n inverse. So, this is supposed to be subset of H modulo n. So, that is what we want to verify. So, there is another way to verify this. Okay. This is something I will leave it to you to check directly. Okay. So, this is something I do not want to do directly. Okay. So, 
if you take the conjugate of this h modulo n with respect to g modulo n then it must be subset of h modulo n write everything in terms of coset then it will become clear but what i want to do i want to actually realize h modulo n as kernel of something so that it becomes clear it is a normal subgroup okay so let us see what will be the map that one can define and then uh, how to prove this is actually kernel of something so here is the natural map okay one can take g modulo capital n and then map to g modulo h okay so what is the map that i'm going to define let me call it uh, okay f again what is this map you take this coset xn and then send it to xh okay so note that we need to verify whether it is well defined or not because here on the left side you may have two representatives because you have used the representatives to define this uh, map x in xn may not be unique okay there could be something else so that means xn can be equal to yn so then we need to check so this is something we need to check then that will imply xh equal to yh okay but what is the meaning of xn being yn so this means x inverse y is in capital n okay this is actually if and only if this is something we verify but that implies what that implies x inverse y is in capital h because n is subset of h okay that is the given hypothesis n is to begin with is a subgroup of h okay so that means this x inverse y is in capital h so but that means what that means if you take x h is same as y h okay so that proves that this is indeed well defined so f is well defined okay so now you can easily see that this is a surjective map because any coset here in g modulo h looks like some x h and obviously you take xn and map it to x h okay so it is well defined and surjective so these two things are obvious now we need to check whether it is a group homomorphism in order to use the first isomorphism theorem so how do we verify whether it is a group homomorphism let's write down what it means you take f f of x1 n x2 n then you have to say that this is same as f of x1 n f of x2 n okay but what is x1 n x2 n so that is exactly x1 x2 n because n is normal okay so then what is f of x1 n x2 n so that is going to be f of x1 x2 n so which is exactly x1 x2 h but on the other hand okay on the left hand right hand side what we get f of x1 n f of x2 n which is x1 h times x2 h okay but h is also normal in g so then this becomes equal to x1 x2 h so that means these two are equal so these two are equal so that verifies f is a group homomorphism okay so that means we can use first isomorphism theorem and then immediately conclude that this group that we have okay g modulo n modulo the kernel so g modulo n modulo the kernel is isomorphic to the image the image is g modulo h okay so now we will determine what is the kernel so what is the kernel kernel is those elements from g modulo n that is map to f of xn equal to 
the identity element inside G modulo H. What it is? It is those x n in G modulo n such that f of x n is equal to x h okay sorry which is x f sorry, which is h here the identity element is h but f of x n is x h and you are demanding this to be h that means if and only if x is in h. So, that means the kernel of f is those x n in G modulo n such that x is in h. But what it is? It is exactly h modulo n by definition. Okay? So, that means we proved h modulo n is normal in G modulo n and this G modulo n modulo H modulo n is isomorphic to G modulo H. Okay. So, in some sense you are allowed to do actually cancellation this n and n you can cancel and then you will get G modulo H. So, this is I am telling just for the sake of remembering okay, not for uh, it does not make any sense what, what is the meaning of cancellation here but one can reinterpret this like that so that one can remember this okay so so basically when you have this kind of uh, tower okay you have h and then you have n both are normal in g okay so then you can look at this g modulo h on the one side and then you have G modulo n where you have H modulo n. So, if you look at the quotient of this that is isomorphic to this. Okay. So, this is uh, something very very interesting because like I said the second iterative pro procedure does not give anything new it gives back to the quotient only. Okay. So, now for example, like we can use uh, in various examples and then uh, understand what will happen to the quotient of quotient. For example, let us let us look at this uh, particular thing. Okay. So, we have seen this example you can see that Z is sitting inside Q, Q is sitting inside R. So, with respect to addition all of them are groups okay, and Z Q they are all subgroups of R. Since R is abelian, so they are all actually abelian subgroups. So, it makes sense to do these quotients R modulo Z and then R modulo Q and then Q modulo Z. Okay. All these groups make sense. So, let me write it again. So, this is your H, this is your N and this is your G. Okay. So, you can make R modulo Q and then you can make R modulo Z and then modulo Q modulo Z. Okay. Basically, what we are saying these two are isomorphic. Okay. We do not get anything new. So, similarly you can you can work out some details like for example, you can take 4 Z which is contained in 2 Z which is contained in Z. Okay. So, then again this is N, this is H and this is G. So, then you can make Z modulo 2 Z. Okay. So, that will be naturally isomorphic to Z modulo 4 Z and then you can go modulo 2 Z modulo 4 Z. So, what it actually tells? So, basically if you recall, so Z modulo 4 Z this has 4 elements okay, because this is a finite group of order 4, it is also a cyclic group. The elements of this is denoted by let us say 0 bar, 1 bar, 2 bar and 3 bar okay, where I bar is just I plus Z this is the cosine. 
ok. So, now that means this 2 is at modulo 4 is at corresponds to subgroup of is at modulo 4 is at ok. This 2 is at modulo 4 is at. So, this corresponds to something inside is at modulo 4 is at. So, you can see what it is ok. So, basically you take all possible cosets ok where the coset representatives are coming from 2 is at. So, that means the cosets corresponding to even integers. So, what they are? They are exactly 0 bar 0 plus 4 is at again 2 bar 2 plus 4 is at. So, 0 plus 4 is at and 2 plus 4 is at they corresponding to this 2 is at modulo 4 is at this cyclic subgroup of order 2. Okay. So, when you take cyclic subgroup uh, cyclic group of order 4 and then if you take the quotient of that which is cyclic uh, subgroup of order 2 inside order 4 then the order of that group will be just to 2 okay. and that again will be cyclic because the quotient of any cyclic is cyclic. Okay. So, you get order 2 cyclic group on the left side that is what we are getting here is at modulo 2 j ok. So, this is something you can do in, in, in general not a problem ok. So, for example, you can take uh, like uh, some devices let us say d j and then sitting inside n j which is sitting inside j ok, where d n they are natural numbers such that let us say d divides n sorry the other way. So, here d here n ok this is exactly like this 4, 2 and 1. So, then you can con construct the following groups. So, this is your n, this is your h, this is your g. So, if you go g modulo h which is d z. So, this is a cyclic group of order d which is isomorphic to z modulo this n z ok. So, if you go back, so what is it? It is z modulo n and h modulo n. So, z modulo n z and then you are going modulo d z modulo n z ok. So, this actually tells you some interesting fact that we proved already. For example, if you take this z modulo n z which is a cyclic group of order n ok, this is cyclic group of order n ok, any cyclic group of order n will be isomorphic to this. So, now what we indeed saying this d z modulo n z is a natural subgroup of this. So, this is a subgroup ok. So, now what is this subgroup? What is the order of this subgroup ok? So, if you recall what is this Lagrange's theorem ok. So, the Lagrange's theorem says the index of the subgroup inside G ok that is G e colon h that is the index that is exactly equal to order of g divided by order of h okay, for finite groups. So, that means the order of this left side which is the finite group uh, cyclic subgroup of order d g z modulo d z that is exactly same as order of the group order of g n z which is n divided by order of d z n z. Okay. So, from this you can easily work out what is the order of this particular subgroup ok. So, what it is you can see that this is exactly equal to n divided by this order of d z divided by n z. So, that means order of d z divided by n z is exactly n by d ok. So, you have a natural cyclic subgroup of order n by d inside z modulo n z ok, 
So, if you recall ok, so the generator of this is exactly that n by d plus n h n ok. So, this is something I explicitly actually constructed when we were working with the cycle group, but here I am demonstrating using this uh, isomorphism theorems also you can see that they, they are there naturally sitting ok, because this is abstractly proved now you can use it for any particular cases. Okay, now look at another example. Okay, so let's say something interesting. Okay, let's say G. So any finite subgroup we know how it looks like. Okay, this is U n. This is the nth roots of unity. So this is a subgroup inside S one, which is a subgroup inside C cross. Okay, this is those ejecting C cross such that the eject power n is one. S one is the unit one elements. Okay. So, now you can treat this is capital N, this is capital H and this is capital G. So, then what happens then you can see that you can take G modulo H. Okay. So, let me write it that is C cross modulo S1. Okay. If, you, if you remember what it is, it is this is the ray. Okay. It is isomorphic to naturally the 0 comma infinity. So, this is isomorphic to ok. So, now you take C cross modulo U n and then you take modulo S 1 modulo U n ok. So, from our earlier discussion we know this is isomorphic to 0 comma infinity that R plus ok that is the ring. But this is something looks somewhat complicated ok, but it, but we are saying that we are we are not indeed getting like anything new ok. So, if you if you actually think about it, so this may be I will leave it as exercise because this is something I already proved. So, when you take C cross modulo U n this is isomorphic to again C cross ok. Again, S1 modulo U n if you think about it, it is again isomorphic to S1 because when you look at uh, the map ok which sends z goes to z power n when mod z is 1 then the image also will, will land in S1 and when you have this z n equal to W ok when, when you look for ok for W in S1 the solution then you can see that mod z power n also will be 1. So, that would imply that mod z is 1. So, the roots of this equation lie here ok that is why you get this isomorphism. So, even though this very weird looking groups like C cross modulo u n modulo s 1 s 1 modulo u n that can be using this isomorphism theorems can be realized to something very well known and again using isomorphism theorem that can be realized to something again very well known ok. So, that is the advantage of having all this isomorphism theorems. So, which actually tells you like how to simplify these quotients ok using the known groups ok. So, again I, I would actually uh, leave it to you to actually work it out uh, some some more uh, examples ok. I will add it in the assignment sheet. Uh, so, for time being I will stop here ok. So, from next class uh, I will I would start actually uh, the group auction ok group acting on a set and then we will see some of the examples on the important uh, consequences of group action ok I will stop here thank you.